Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Denise St. Marie, and I've nominated John Fechner for the Walker Cultural Leader Series, which is presented by the Marilyn I. Walker School of Fine and Performing Arts. Uh, this year, 2020, it'll be taking place online. So allow me to introduce John. We're going to do an interview style uh, talk, and uh, he's just holding on the line right now as we speak. John Fechner is a street and multimedia artist who created hundreds of environmental, social, political, and conceptual works consisting of stenciled words, symbols, dates, and icons painted outdoors and around the world. Since 1968, Fechner has addressed issues involving concepts of perception and transformation, as well as specific environmental and sociological concerns, such as urban decay, greed, chemical pollution, mass media, and tributes to the North American Indigenous peoples. All right. Hi, John. How are you doing? Good morning. So, John, I just wanted to jump right into um, asking you about uh, Broken Promises, which is a really uh, like a historical treasure piece, if you ask me. Uh, and I wondered if you could tell me a little bit of the a background of, of this piece, especially for people who it's, it's new to them and they're just sort of seeing it for the first time. Well, at that time, uh, it was a crisis in New York. Uh, the economy, financial, uh, redlining in the Bronx. Basically, neighborhoods were being targeted, not just the Bronx is burning, but neighborhoods were being redlined that started basically outlining areas that they wouldn't support. And they wouldn't support the firehouses, police uh, effectiveness in these particular areas. So that led to arson. And this all grew out of the middle uh, 70s. And I went to the Bronx because my collaborator, Don Light, we went to school in the Bronx in uh, Lehman College, which was in 1973, 75. That's where I met him. Don Light was from the Bronx. I'm from Queens, but that's how we met at graduate school. And then we eventually, and he lived very close to the area, which is Charlotte Street, and that's the South Bronx, where these spray painted messages, broken promises, falsus promesas, last hope, save our schools, and broken treaties and decay. These were six stencils, really there were seven, because I did save our schools separate and then save our schools. So there was um, these moment that I thought it was the time to do these particular projects as I was already outdoors doing spray painting for years already. But uh, we thought that this was the right time to put it, our work in this one location. And that was the People's Convention. And it was a gathering of different people about discussions on race, nuclear race, gender, uh, affordable housing, a lot of different issues. Floyd Westerman, American Indian, uh, participated, and a lot of community groups from not just the South Bronx, but uh, from all parts of the United States and, and elsewhere. And it was interesting because it was an alternative convention to the Democratic Convention, which was taking place at Madison Square Garden. So this was the people's voice. And there was a gathering of people. And I didn't know that Ronald Reagan, who was the candidate at the time, because the broken promises goes back to Jimmy Carter as president and some of the things that he didn't do for the people. And some people get that a little uh, not correct, but that's where it starts from. So again, there wasn't like there was going to be some type of uh, media event, but there was a gathering of people in the rubble. They, they built their own White House out of construction oh. and plywood and painted a White wow. House. And there was a lot of interesting things that were uh, being done, not just the stencils. The reason you see t the stencils kind of by themselves is because uh, I would normally take a photograph either right after I did a piece or go back early the next morning. And of course, what happened is that when uh, presidential candidate Ronald Reagan appeared, then there were some famous photographs that it was like uh, he 
was standing there almost like a prop. <laughs> but the people, the people were yelling as video videos of that of of you know. Uh, they would say, you know, talk to the people, not the press, you know, and everybody, you know, rap was starting at that time and the people were angry. And he says, I can't do anything unless you elect me. So uh, he did get elected. And, uh, well, we weren't too happy about the nuclear race and a lot of things that were happening in the environment at the time. So um, that's basically the story of uh, broken promises and the stencils in that particular area. Thank you had these really interesting pieces that are sort of throughout the city about decay. Um, Yes. I was, and there's a bit of a theme, like you have had uh, industrial remains and these types of stencils. How did you sort of come upon deciding where to put them or, or how you, would it be, would you be inspired in the moment or would you make a plan to go back and do that or? Well, as a kid, I grew up amongst factories in some of the areas that you see uh, decay, the abandoned industrial America. Yeah. Those pieces were done in and around Sunnyside. Now, Sunnyside is an area that's uh, in northwest Queens, surrounded by Long Island City, Astoria, uh, Woodside, Jackson Heights. So I, this is the area I grew up with and was very familiar with. I would go to the Sunnyside Railroad Yards and play as a kid, eight years old. My father, my, excuse me, my brother, who was seven years my senior, caught me down there, and it was a kind of a dangerous place. So I was always trespassing very young, and there was that sense of adventure, and uh, to, you know, not going to the park, going to you know the, the railroad yards was more interesting. And I was pretty young, so my brother bawled me out and gave me, uh, I'm telling dad and everything like that. So you know, what are you doing here down in these you know, railroad yards? So. But I guess it, I, I just continue. <laughs> so the philosophy behind it is obviously like the third place, the third place philosophy of not home and not work or not home and school, but that other pl- outside place. The streets were always that place for me, whether it was a playground, a park, uh, playing hard sports in terms of contact sports on, you know, nothing was on uh, sort of green suburban lawns or f- football fields it was you know hard skating roller skating those types of things so i was very familiar with this area because i grew up in it and when i went to uh, um, ps1 i was awarded a studio there in 1976 we were the first artists to go in there i was spending more time doing this work um, yes i received a call from alana heiss she was the head of the ps1 in moma and I didn't even know who she was. I, I mean, I knew of what was happening, that was going to be this room show. But uh, I wasn't part of that. But we were the first artist I uh, was awarded a space, a studio space. And it was a nominal fee to pay uh, studio. I think it was $60 uh, for a month or something like that, something for a big classroom. But it was a raw space. So a lot of artists were dealing with raw space. And this goes back to uh, triggers back to earlier times as well, Gordon Matta Clark and some of the people that were doing things around 1970. So the real combination of how I arrived at these stencils is it combines a couple of different philosophies. Number one, a very short statement that look official, like almost a song title. You know, why write a whole song when the title can convey just as a dramatic effect so instead of i was doing poetry as a youngster and as a teenager and obviously influenced by bob dylan and uh you know how people could say something in one line and it you know it could it could really be powerful blowing in the wind the times they are changing for example but i was also interested in one phrase of his a song positively fourth street and it was interesting because in that song, he does he never says positively Fort Street. It's a song, uh, you have a lot of nerve to say you are my friend. You know, it's <laughs> his song. And there's no point in the song where he says those lyrics. So I thought the mystery of that was pretty interesting and unique. So as I looked in these areas and driving back and forth from my parents' apartment, they always had a rented apartment. We were in Jackson Heights at this point. 
So it was just driving back. I used the car, you know, an old clunker, GM clunker, and I would be going to PS1 and starting to work a little bit more like with rubble. But it was all based off of the environment, which had a big, important component to us uh, kids of the 60s. And uh, the whole Earth catalog in 1968, when I went started college, everyone who went to college that year had the whole Earth catalog and it had that first picture of the moon from uh, the Earth from outer space. So this whole idea of perception and seeing things from other angles and other worlds was important to me in my development as an artist and as a student in undergraduate school and in graduate school. Uh, to see things from a different perspective. I had a teacher, Miriam Brummer, and Miriam Brummer, uh, she taught me drawings and uh, painting in undergraduate school. And the interesting thing about sometimes people who really make an impression on you when you're young, when you're a student, is that they say something and then you just run with that. And she says, there's other worlds, uh, you know, I was doing probably traditional drawings with, you know, can't, not canvas, but, uh, you know, the easel set up and doing the, the, the nude model and those type of normal uh, class foundation classes. And then when I got into maybe the second or third year with her, she says, well, you know, you could look at other worlds and that one of those other worlds was through a microscope. So I went to the biology lab at New York Tech where I went to school, undergraduate. And I did studies of uh, microorganisms looking through a microscope. And this started my barely visible portrait series prior to uh, doing the stenciling. But I wanted to sort of provide that information in terms of how you come upon something that's sighted outdoors. You know, how does that relate to uh, where does that come from? Well, it was something to pinpoint these uh, areas of decay and abandonment and to make it look official with a stamp, like a stencil stamp. So sometimes they weren't completely centered or they were askew. Mm -hmm. So it looked like somebody actually with a rubber stamp, like canceled or fired or any of those types of terms that maybe you were applying for something when something got rubber stamped. So I wanted it to be on these pieces of, uh, I guess, corpse of, of, of people just abandoning cars you know that you could see what was going on and it was kind of a scary point in time for a lot of people in new york in, in that particular period i wonder if you could talk about the stencils the the physical making of the work for you what is that process like well in terms of process i was always open to using different materials mm. and i was going back to college i was using opaque projectors mm. a lot because there was an article in Life magazine where uh, Roy Lichtenstein talked about, uh, you know, the image invader type of thing, you know, and, and the cartooning and using projectors. And that was the first time, obviously, pop art. This is going back to when I'm in high school. So I started to work with the opaque projector in projecting uh, portraits, which I was doing of my friends. And after that, I would always have using different tools. So that was one of them. Uh, and in terms of stenciling, it was just straight from the hardware store. I would get a set of Roman numerals that you would normally pick up uh, either in an art supply store or a hardware store. Mm -hmm. And then I took that small little stencil, a little plate, and just projected it with an opaque projector. So I blew up the scale. That was mm -hmm. the way I did it. So. It was one of the things that um, was very simple, but I always worked with the tools that were at hand, you know, just try to create magic out of something that was kind of simple, but it was trying to focus you as a target on a particular area, or a lot of times there wasn't that much graffiti where I did my projects, because I was very, I knew New York City, I was a mail delivery uh, messenger for three summers, uh, 68 through 70. Mm. And so I was very familiar with not just the city itself, but the spectrum of, of where there was graffiti and where there wasn't. And there wasn't that much graffiti because a lot of some of the things that I saw were coming out of like the West Side Story, story of, of pieces and gangs and turf and, you know, declaring what's yours and what's mine. And 
the usual uh, skeleton heads or uh, ace of spades, you know, top hat with the cane. You know, these are like kind of normal things that came out of the 50s and the doo-wop music and the different gangs of, of not just the New York, but the, the specific street areas. Yeah. And uh, there were very defined lines and boundaries that were established. So that was, I didn't have boundaries, mm-hmm. but I took it and tried to make it open to anything that came along that I saw, and I would know and say, "Oh, the, because that's part of the process." I would say, "Well, okay, you know, this is something that needs to be addressed. You know, where would be the right place to put instant this, instant that?" And you know, did it repeatedly and as a repetition line. The first ones that were done, and they were done right in the center of New York City, the Pan Am building, so long ago called this Grand Central Station, but that was the name of the building originally. And you could not avoid seeing instant this, instant that, which ran along the building and was along Park Avenue. So, uh, you know, because, of course, of knowing the city and where to do particular pieces, that was kind of, you know, just in a back of, you know, my bag of tricks. I mean, I was so familiar. My family grew up on the Lower East Side. And so, uh, I mean, people would ask me, how do you know how to get to these places? <laughs> I said, I've lived here my whole life. So uh, I kind of embraced using New York as a tool itself. So that's, uh, again, with the stencils and with uh, collaborations, which eventually moved into spending more time in the Bronx and collaborating with some of the graffiti artists and rap artists when I started to do more multimedia. I wanted to um, uh, point out, this is a very famous piece, uh, Wheels Over Indian Trails, and you did a whole series of of, uh, works. I wondered if you could uh, tell me a little bit more about how this came to be for you, how you decided to make this work, and, and maybe even, I was thinking the where the sensitivity comes from in you because you seem to really champion voices that um are underrepresented in society and there's this i immediately when i saw some of this work myself i thought oh this person is so sensitive you know so maybe a little Thank s- you. <laughs> story about <clears throat> where you think that comes from and also how how this work came to be the work was a tribute to uh, Native Americans, indigenous to New York and New Jersey areas. And it really, when I was doing the stencils, some of the earliest stencils, which was done under an an anonymous name, Gary Hutter. Hmm. And those were the random dates about memory. And it would say uh, September 1955, or it would say fall 1941, dates that had nothing particular to me, but they were related to my barely visible portrait work mm. on on canvas. And I made that jump in this idea of, well, somebody's memory is just as important as what I'm saying or my own memory. So mm. I would just put out those dates randomly in different areas. And the idea was when I did that body of work and going into some of these uh, areas next to highways, or next to uh, toxic waste dumps, there were still kind of marsh areas that were very fertile. And it really struck me that, you know, who was here before all this garbage, you know, and toxic waste dumps, and you know, everybody was turning towards, you know, looking at, at you know, the environment, obviously, from the late 60s and, and up into 1980. And, um, so, when I went to these areas, they were very still and quiet. And I felt that, well, I did have to do some research. And that's how I started on doing research. I went to the Jamaica uh, Library and went to their special collections area. And I started looking at the history of what was then, um, you know, there was information. There was a museum of the American Indian. But a lot of these titles and, you know, where names came from, so Rockaway, Land of Sand, the Rekawaki Indians. Okay, maybe that's not exactly w- who were there. Maybe it was the Lenape Indians, because now we're talking about like uh, how people are really defining, you know, their identity. Mm-hmm. But in those times, I was using material from the Museum of the American Indian in New York, and also J- the Jamaica uh, Research Library. So uh, some of the titles, again, 
Mespechi Indian 1607. That was then became Maspa. So I uh, stencil those st stencils in those particular areas and do some research. And a lot of it was done in collaboration with the youngsters that I was new at the park where I did a lot of projects. So th they became fun projects. And the stencils would always be done, at least the big ones, one letter at a time with a, a, a crew. You know, sometimes I did pieces by myself, but I normally would have some people helping me with that. And the smaller type stencils could always be sort of flip flop together. You could just carry it and just go to a site mm. and tape it up. And, and you it. even came to Canada in this one shot we have where uh, on the on the right. Um, yes. Uh, and I don't know if you remember where you were there. Or it's outside Toronto. I think. It's it's. On the approach, I believe, to Toronto, on the, I, I listed it in, in my first book in 1982, the Queen Elizabeth uh, Way. Uh -huh. And we saw this, me and uh, Dave Santanello, who was working with me, and I said, well, this is a great location. But, you know, it, was, it would look like I, there was guards around mm -hmm. because uh, there was equipment there. But it was very... I said, we'll go back at night. So this is one of the two projects I did where I started the text from the end. And I was going to put more text, but in case we were caught, at least the word Indians would be up there. And there's two other, other time I did this on a, in a church where they were knocking down the demolition of St. James Cathedral, mortal wound. I started with the word wound and then did the word mortal. And the reason doing because there was construction going on and the priest actually came out of the rectory and started yelling at us while we were stenciling, you know, why is you doing this in my church? But the church was being knocked down for a parking lot. And that's what we were yelling back at them because I did a whole interview with people from the uh, surrounding community, and they were not happy about it. And that's the Mortal Wound Project in, Saint, in uh, Newark, New Jersey, St. James Church. Nice. I want to just move to the next slide, because uh, I thought this was, when I found this, I was like, it's like you projected into the past and into the future at the same time with I Still Have a Dream, which was really, it looks like it was done in 2012, I think. and. Now we've just gone through Black Lives Matter movement again, and there's always this sort of reoccurring edging forward of equity, um, which I think just shows your sensitivity to champion voices. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about this piece. All these different times are based off of a few of the projects, him obviously to the current Black Lives Matter movement, but the I still have a dream. Obviously, is a is a Martin Luther King uh, Jr.'s mm -hmm. statement, and having grown up and participated in moratoriums and peace rallies in the late '60s, uh, I was familiar, obviously, with these uh, the issues and and making social statements and trying to do something for everyone, not just being somebody who's pointing out a particular problem, but maybe to give them some uplift a bit. And that became, I still have a dream, and more recently, the Him piece. But the Him piece goes back to a project with Brian Albert that I did on the highway mm. in 1986. And that should be kind of in the same, it was more a little bit multimedia, it was a photograph that was glowing with electronic lights that were hot wired to the lamppost so when the it was at dusk this head of Martin Luther King Jr. would glow and it was kind of very effective as, and it had the words him so this is almost like a a re recreation of it but adding the words rest in power instead of rest in peace you have created multiples of the works throughout the years. And I was wondering, mm -hmm. as you see them in different times and places, like my ad is no ad, it, both it's original and then uh, it is uh, augmented and also it's uh, in um, telephone booth takeover, as these sort of different times and places where the work continues to uh, grow, if it changes for you or if it doesn't, why or why not? I think some of the 
first messages were obviously direct and clear and, and succinct. There was nothing to confuse you. Some of them might have been cryptic, but connecting to what happens or how they relive in different technologies, I always said that new material is new thinking mm -hmm. and that you, know, you can't think completely new with old tools. So whenever there was something that was available to me, whether it was computer graphics, uh, 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 system, I would embrace that technology very in a raw way. And I wouldn't try to com command it. I would just try to use it as in a homemade way. You know, the pixelization, I kind of, that would bother people, but I've sort of embraced that because that led to the whole real space invader projects that it did with Don Light, which mm -hmm. was really talking about, you know, Oh, these cute little uh, characters, you know, they're, they're fun. Well, they're not actually fun. They're like, um, mm -hmm. you know, they're like uh, sugar and sugar is not good for you. And your, your space has been invaded. And it's not just about outside space. It's about your mind and your heart and your soul and your emotions are being invaded by television and advertising or corporations and government control of, you know, uh, electronic uh games for kids and war games and you know you're getting them ready to fight real wars by using these seduction tools of you know icons and imagery that look kind of cute and fun so that's a little bit broader spectrum which includes a few of the collaborations with don so don light all the multiples too i love i love the multiples because i think that's how ads operate right they're constantly hitting you and you're kind yes. of constantly hitting back and being like, every time you say it, I can say it differently. So, mm -hmm. Well, that's why I think the new movement and the signs that you see by everybody in the protests of these days is great. And I think they're doing, everybody has a voice and that's the most important thing. And some people say, well, you know, are you participating with that? Well, you know, some of the ways I participate is I'm still doing some of these projects and some people help me. So that key continually changes uh, the way things are done. Uh, but I think that goes back to conceptualism like Saul Witt or some early artist that would uh, send instructions in terms of uh, projects in a museum or a gallery space. But I criticized a lot of that too. And you mentioned the word multiples. It's kind mm -hmm. of in multiple locations and multimedia as opposed to real multiples or what most people think a multiple is as a print edition. And I really don't have that much work as print editions. In fact, I hardly ever did print editions. I did monotypes or as an artist, I really never used those forms so much and maybe going to start to do that a little bit now these, in these days. Yeah, I guess I just use the word loosely, but I do understand what you're saying. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, you sort of touched on this a little bit in the uh, previous conversation, but maybe if I could get your sort of succinct uh, view of what really pushed you to make this these these uh, sets of works. Well, it comes out of the different crises again, the crack crisis, uh, the AIDS crisis. This was all starting to happen in the eighties, and these projects were being exposed. Mm -hmm. uh, Love Canal, Luis Da, you know, those a number of people who were working and doing things that. Uh, were drawing attention and mothers who were protesting uh, different uh, Indian Point, uh, Love Canal upstate, those uh, Harrisburg, there's so many different Three Mile Island. There were these areas that were hot spots that people were completely, you know, there wasn't that many men. I mean, a, a lot of the women who basically stood up were the people who led the fight, which was a really important thing that uh, I kind of embraced a bit and i did work with a number of different people at that time on the music and bringing in other voices and into it wasn't just my voice so this idea of addressing hotbeds which it was a very toxic junkie that was the low east side that was a drug den um the, sh the show was um uh, called the black and white show and i did a piece that was outside lorraine o'grady a black 
woman artist organized the show and that was the inside show and uh, a lot of people with it were in there Keith Haring Basquiat I think had work or that was pulled out because of the gallery but there was a lot of representation of different uh, people of color at that show and I wanted to do this piece outdoors and she said sure and you know I mean there was no permission for it it was an abandoned it was just a cemented uh, drug den mm. wow I have two important questions that I want to ask. So one is, I mean, you keep going. What what keeps you motivated to continue to make work all these years later? I, um, you know, twenty twenty we're in, and you're you're still you're still pushing your practice forward. You're still relevant. I think your messages are still very relevant. And I don't know if that's sad because history hasn't changed as much as it needs to, but. What what keeps you going after all this time? I think just to be a participant, a voice, and to make something get more noticed. And mm -hmm. if it if it's not really art, then it's just a social message. And I don't say that in a bad way, but then it's perceived only by that way. Uh, I never really got so part of the art world that uh, my works are shown in museums we're more like in betweeners type of thing and in between history a lot of artists like that mm -hmm. and who continue to work today people from the lower east side and, and different areas so i liked always using the technology and i did a series called kick writing which was based off of jack kerouac's and I have a lot of words, if you type in the word kick writing without the G, okay. just drop the G, and you'll see a lot of these pieces out of the stencil pieces that were thrown out onto the internet. So they were random sort of selections of, of uh, different phrases, and, and but they would get all jumbled up. Mm. And I had it on Flickr, I had it on Tumblr. Some accounts I take down, so things disappear, but that is basically... The idea of my work, I mean, it's this ongoing thing that uh, everything's changing and f it's ephemeral. As much as you try to uh, push it away, sometimes the ephemeral work is worth more than the actual artworks that represent uh, a particular period. And I think that's the fragileness that I try to still continue to have that you know, even though it's technical and it looks uh, computerized, uh, try to show the you know the humanness that still is is in life, and you know, and you have compassion about it. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, uh, what advice would you give to young artists today? What would you tell the younger you? I guess <laughs> someone <laughs> who's out there, you know, just beginning and feeling maybe a little overwhelmed. Who knows? Well, during the difficult times, people band together. And I think the most important thing is for an artist to really find something that is their voice. And how do you do this? Well, it's got to be done in some way that you participate. And I think out of all this protest and the participation will garnish something that becomes something new. And that expression is pretty, will be important because it's so many inputs that will eventually allow other voices or the freedom to express themselves and hopefully in new spaces. And I don't know really where the new space might be in the future. Uh, that'd be for your generations and future generations. Uh, where's the best place to do work in terms of being part of the community? Maybe the art changes completely different or the art market. I don't follow these things that much at all. So, um, it's kind of interesting to, to say, you know, have your own voice. I would always tell artists, uh, the best thing I would do is do things that are different. When you see everybody going in one direction, just do the opposite, go the other way. And I was lucky to be afforded that at a young age. And I was told by my Catholic brother, uh, Brother Michael Dundon, who was a great artist, he taught me Latin and not only art, but he taught me how to do things on my own as a kid. And he told me to go to the museum. I went to the Whitney Museum. I was 15 years old. I saw uh, Andrew Wyeth's show. And that whole idea of I was surrounded by adults standing in line and I saw this painting, Young America. 
and it's a boy on a bicycle and he's staring off in the distance. It's done in 1950 by Andrew Wyeth. And I was intrigued by it because he wasn't looking directly at the mountains. He was like looking out of, off the canvas. So that's that whole out of the box type of thing that to make, you know, if you're going to do, do something, make it magical and make it that it's, it's, it spurs not just the imagination of the viewer, but maybe more of a participatory where that particular viewer starts to be part of the artwork or make art on their own. So I was intrigued and fascinated. I stood in front of that painting for so long because I was wondering what the boy was staring at off the horizon and off the canvas. And that led me to always doing things in, in a way that would be different than what other people did. When photorealism was the big um, movement, I did black and white, barely visible portraits. I went for something that was subtle and, and a different approach. That was the thing I would always mention in terms of how to find your voices. Sometimes it's staying in on a Friday night, not going out on a weekend, and that's how I did it. And that's what I would say to any student as well. If you're really going to try to make work, uh, study autobiographies of other artists, writers, musicians, I found that more intriguing than looking at sometimes bodies of work. I wanted to know what uh, Arthur Rubinstein did, a piano player, or what Tennessee Williams did as a youngster. I would read their autobiographies, and that always enriched me in my approach to um, art making. Oh, beautiful. And I would recommend that. I would <laughs> recommend that to students today. Amazing. I think, well, John, thank you so much thank you. for taking the time. It has been lovely. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye-bye.